Support WrestleTalk! Give us a subscribe. Thanks for your support on Patreon, Paulie Dangerously Jarman. Seth Rollins finally slays the beast, Brock Lesnar. Again? Goldberg is the gift that just keeps on spearing. And Bray Wyatt just used his own severed head as a lantern. Luke, hold me, hold me tight. I'm so scared right now. I'm Ollie Davis. Press the thumbs up button, give us a subscribe, and answer our question of the day in the comments down below. What did you think of The Fiend's in-ring debut? Because I'll be replying to people from out of nowhere. Look at, look at me. I'm in, I'm in Bray Wyatt's severed mouth. Also vote in the poll above my head to give your rating for the show, where you can choose from Best of Both Worlds, Great Purview, Thumbs in the Middle, Meh Purview, and Worst of Both Worlds, while Luke and I review WWE SummerSlam 2019. The pre-show featured the usual stuff that isn't really worth talking about. What do you mean there was a tease of the Bullet Club reunion in WWE? The OC approached Finn Balor backstage and told him if he needs help, he just needs to say when. And going by his neck later on in the night, it's time to say when, Finn. There was some fun 24-7 stuff with Drake, Maverick, Carmella and R-Truth, but it feels like this trio jumped the shark a few weeks ago. Drew Gulak defended his Cruiserweight Championship against Oni Lorcan in a decent match that no one really cared about, and Buddy Murphy had his main roster debut match against Apollo Crews, which was shut down when Rowan attacked Murphy for accusing him of attacking Roman Reigns, with Daniel Bryan watching backstage looking conflicted. So yeah, there really wasn't a lot to talk about on this pre-show. What do you mean Edge returned and hit a spear on Elias? The first wrestling move he's done since his retirement announcement in 20 2011. This was an awesome moment, and will no doubt spark rumours of a possible in-ring return for Edge down the line. And finally, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss defended their WWE Women's Tag Team Championships against the Iconics, with Bliss and Cross firmly set as babyfaces for no rhyme or reason, and the commentators have now changed their minds that Cross and Bliss are best friends. This storyline sucks. Bliss cosplayed as Buzz Lightyear for some reason, and won with a twisted Bliss, which none of the commentators called falling with style, and thanks to Corey Graves' nice jacket, I'm gonna call that failing with style. The main card kicked off with another WWE legend returning, Pyro! I just wish Edge and Pyro returned at the same time during his entrance, and SummerSlam kept the pre-show's excitement going by opening on the Raw Women's title match. In one corner, the badass babyface Becky Lynch, and in the other, the recently heelish Natalia, who came out in her home country draped in the Canadian flag. Gotta love that really clear heel face dynamic. The two had a terrific opening match, paced perfectly around the submission stipulation and them trying to get to the ring apron, not because WWE just sometimes chooses to ignore the no rope break rule, but so they can use that positioning as leverage to get out of holds. After trying each other's submissions, Becky eventually made Natty tap in the disarmor. WWE ingeniously followed the 12 minute submission based opener with Goldberg continually spearing Dolph Ziggler. Like over and over again, and then some more when you thought it had all stopped, it was great. Goldberg's random return might have come more out of nowhere than a Randy Orton vs Kofi Kingston count out finish. WWE title shade, but his special attraction match here was booked perfectly. Goldberg shrugged off two super kicks to hit a spear and a jackhammer for a 1 minute 50 second win. But Dolph wasn't done. He won wanted another go. So Goldberg speared him again. And then again. Ziggler was effectively the Black Knight from Monty Python's Holy Grail. Goldberg was brilliant, but massive credit to Ziggler for selling the spear like he's Shawn Michaels covered in flubber from the 1997 Robin Williams comedy movie Flubber. SummerSlam was already off to a hot start, and it only got hotter with the excellent United States Championship match between Ricochet and AJ Styles. Ricochet cosplayed as Nightwing and channeled his inner flying Graysons to step across Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson like they were floats in a swimming pool to hit a Hurricane Rana on Styles. Ricochet brilliantly sold his leg throughout the match, certainly better than Seth Rollins did with his ribs, but couldn't overcome the numbers game, trying to hit a Phoenix Splash but was caught by an AJ Styles clash for the retention. This was great from start to end, and only cemented the OC as one of the best acts in the company when AJ set his dogs on the defenseless Ricochet after the match. Still, the NXT Tag Team Champion Street Profits were backstage to cut another fabulous promo, and were joined by Ric Flair for some funny shenanigans. 
happened. But sadly, it appeared that all the fun of Goldberg and Flair and Ricochet and AJ tearing it up meant that the Toronto crowd did not care one iota about Bailey versus Ember Moon. That or Ember Moon being beaten up for two weeks leading into the pay-per-view somehow made people not take her seriously as a title contender. I'll let you be the judge on that one. Bailey won with a second rope Bailey to belly in a meh encounter. Shane McMahon brought out Elias as the special guest enforcer for his match against Kevin Owens next to avoid any shenanigans. But who's there to stop the Shane Anigans? It's been a long night. KO was confounded again and again by Elias, getting a visual pin, having the ref pulled out for a fantastic near fall, and in a great character spot where Owens nearly used a chair on Shane, risking the DQ loss. The finish was a wicked piece of sports entertainment with ref bumps, a kick to the dick, and a stone cold stunner, so the Attitude Era. And KO stood tall for the Shane feud to presumably continue on Tuesday nights. Trish Stratus and Charlotte went over 16 minutes in their match. They had the second shortest match on the card by just five seconds. This didn't need to be so long and could have easily been cut in half. That said, the wrestlers really got the crowd into it, mainly thanks to Charlotte just wrestling herself while Trish did athletic flips in her general proximity. That's not what this is about though. The scene afterwards of an extended stand innovation for Trish having a damn good showing in front of her hometown in what's likely her last match was a deeply heartwarming moment. I've been rather critical of the build to Randy Orton vs Kofi Kingston, mostly because there was so much left on the table in terms of storytelling. I mean, the final two weeks of build to the match were just solo promos, and it felt like Randy and Kofi knew this going into the match, and so started off hot to make it feel like it was a real blood feud that had been building for a decade. And it worked! for a bit. The crowd was split for both guys at the start, but the match did drag somewhat towards the end of their 16 and a half minutes of wrestling, which didn't help the crowd enjoy the double count out finish which they chanted Bull S word at. And it really was Bull S word. Kofi then frigged out after the match and laid out Orton with kendo stick shots to a mostly apathetic crowd. So it was basically AJ versus Samoa Joe from last year. And then came what a lot of people were hotly anticipating for this show. The debut of Bray Wyatt's new new character, The Fiend. I tend not to use this word too much when reviewing anything, but this was as close to perfection as you could come. In fact, it was perfect. Everything about this was flawless. From the terrifyingly creepy entrance with a dark version of Bray Wyatt's old theme, to The Fiend even carrying a lantern made of a severed head of Wyatt himself, to the new in-ring style and character work of The Fiend battling his inner personalities, to the finish of The Fiend catching Balor's coup de grace with the mandible claw for the win. I'll say it again, this was flawless and the single greatest re-debut of a character in the history of professional wrestling. I don't want to sound too hyperbolic about this, but The Fiend is the best thing in wrestling right now. And if you think I am overreacting to all of this, check out these highlights of me and Ollie watching The Fiend's debut from our live stream. Oh my god, oh my god it's the head of Bray Wyatt. That he's using as a... He's using it as the lantern. Holy crap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's a, like a dark version of his even dark theme. <laughs> <laughs> Good name bar as well. Yeah. Oh, I love it so much. I think he's going to take the mask off. Oh, I'll keep it on, mate. No, he's not. Yeah. It's almost like he was trying to fight to take oh, it off. Oh, this is deep. Oh, that head. This oh, is the this freaking is best thing in WWE. So it's the coolest thing. <laughs> this is absolutely the coolest thing in WWE. Head he's butt. using headbutts. Oh, God. You can't have that as a finisher, can you? Um, <laughs> we just break his Gosh. neck. <laughs> oh, it's the mandible claw. That was a really cool transition. Yeah. Oh, that was perfect. Perfect. Flawless. It's only, it's like, but it's now leveled up because we've seen him in ring. Oh, he's still there. It's on the stage. Oh, that's chilling, mate. The crowd loved it as well. Yeah. Really worked. That 
Uh, that should have been the main event. Even though The Fiend's in-ring debut will go down as the spiritual main event, that actual final slot went to Seth Rollins and Brock Lesnar, who made up for their weak go-home angle and Seth just generally being on Twitter with some great in-ring drama. Right out the gate, Seth backflipped out of a German suplex and hit the stomp for an amazing early near fall, hooking the crowd in from the start. But Brock soon got on top, awesomely and effortlessly swinging Seth around by the tape on his torso. But because good psychology and selling gets in the way of fun stuff, Rollins ignored that particular injury and hit a huge frog splash off the top of the ring post on Brock through the Spanish commentary desk outside. A SummerSlam main event worthy high spot and then hit two more stomps back in the ring for the win. We can now happily say that the Universal Champion is once again Becky Lynch's boyfriend Seth Rollins. SummerSlam 2019 was an excellent show and such a fun experience to watch live. The Fiend's debut will go down as an all-time great WWE moment. Goldberg's destruction of Dolph was the perfect mixture of badass and comedy. Seth finally got rid of Brock Lesnar as Universal Champion. Again, Trish had a lovely send-off, and oh my god, I keep forgetting Edge returned and actually hit an in-ring move for the first time since his retirement. The only real negative was the screwy finish of Kofi vs Orton. It's been a really great few weeks of WWE TV, which oddly coincides with reports that Paul Heyman has more control backstage, and this pay-per-view terrifically continued that momentum. I'm very happy to say, SummerSlam 2019 is best of both worlds. But what about that crazy Adam Cole versus Johnny Gargano match from NXT TakeOver Toronto the previous night? Watch our review by clicking the video on the right to also find out which top indie star looks set to be on their way to WWE. I've been Ollie Davis, and that was wrestling.